I dog sit for a family friend. They much prefer to have someone stay at the house with the dogs. I grew up in a town in the middle of nowhere, and I love the countryside. So for me, this is like a staycation, because I live in the city now, and never have any time to myself. The house is in the middle of nowhere. When I say nowhere, I mean this place takes two hours to get to from work, and is about 45 minutes to the nearest town or interstate. There is one neighbour within five miles and he lives directly across the street. I'm used to this where I'm from. It's supposed to give you the space you need, but also help you feel safer, knowing you have at least one person nearby. However, this guy has done nothing but make me feel unsafe as hell. So I get to Terry and John's house, and they're telling me the drill, when to feed the dogs, two super cute and spoiled Australian cattle dogs, and water the plants and stuff. Then as they're loading up their stuff to take to the car, Terry says, Oh, don't forget to tell her about Steve. John says, Oh yeah, don't worry about the neighbour across the street. He's harmless. The guy drinks a lot, and is a little off, but totally harmless. Hell, the guy has lost his license so many times, all he can do is drive a moped round to get to town. However, just in case, this is where we keep our firearm. Steve has three, don't tread on me confederate flags, and two plain confederate flags, all of which are hanging from his porch. Of course, he's a little weird. Then he takes me to where the weapon is located, and explains that it's loaded. And if I were to use it, I don't need to cock it, just pull the trigger extra hard. At this point, I'm like, whatever, you keep that in your house, when it takes police at least 45 minutes to get here. Still, I've got no worries, I'm used to drunk weirdos. I know how to handle them. I love this life in the middle of nowhere and I've gotten two protective dogs that will always attack on a one word command. So I feel quite safe. Terry and John leave around 3pm. I took the dogs for a walk and play some frisbee, and begin to unload my stuff while they're still worn out from all the running. As I come back for my second load of stuff as I'm staying there for a week, I needed work clothes and my Xbox to keep me entertained in the late evenings, I hear their neighbour Steve slam on his door, seemingly having a phone conversation. I first just heard his voice faintly. Then he started yelling, asking where they went. The dogs are just hearing him now and starting to growl softly. I tell the dogs to calm down. It's alright, I say. Just Steve, remember? He probably wants some privacy. Let's go inside. As I grab my stuff, I hear him yell again. I do care about my kids. And then I hear him throw something on the unpaved road behind me. Turns out it was his cell phone. As I'm grabbing my stuff, the dog starts going crazy and runs a few feet behind me, barking and growling viciously. I drop my stuff, turn around and see the neighbor at the end of the driveway just staring at me. I yell at the dogs to calm down and get back to my side. They do, and then I gave Steve a friendly wave. In my head I'm thinking, this is kind of weird, but he's probably been drinking. Plus they said the guy's harmless, and I've dog sat before, and never had a problem with neighbours. He then takes a single step towards me, and says in a manipulative sounding voice, You all right? Steve is wearing dirty jeans, work boots, and a dirty red hoodie, and a red hat with the confederate flag on it. He's also got brown dirty hair to his shoulders, and a beard that's probably five inches long. Yeah, I'm pretty good. My name's Pip. Just dog sitting for Johnny and Terry this week, and I'm ready to get them all in for the evening. I look down at the dogs to see their reaction. They look like they're just about to attack, and I've never seen them like this before. How about yourself? We sat in silence for about 30 seconds, before he stated, I'm asking if you're alright. I'm Steve. Nice to meet you, Steve. 
Thanks for being a good neighbor and checking on me. But like I said, I'm good. Are you all right? This time, the silence lasts for probably a whole minute. And I figure he's wasted. I should just get inside with my stuff. So I turn around, finish grabbing my things. And as I do, I hear him take one more step on the gravel driveway. The dogs bark again. I turn around and Steve says, I know them. Them dogs won't do nothing to me. There's some damn good dogs, that's for sure. I begin feeling super uneasy, so I close my trunk and turn around to see if he's gonna say anything else. I was about to tell him that I was gonna go inside and then instead awkwardly said, yeah, I'm, yeah, what? He yelled. I'm shocked and say, yeah, I'm going inside now. Thanks for checking, Steve. I'm fine. I've got the dogs this week. Have a good night. I turn and go and the dogs follow me with no problem. Steve continues to stand where I left him for 10 minutes, just staring at the house. Note, this house does not have a front door. There's a side door and a back door. The back door is the main door because the front door of the house has those big green fluffy privacy trees. So I can't even see his house through the front window. You can't see either doors from the street. You have to come onto the property to see them. It's about six o'clock and where I'm at, the sun starts going down around that time, but doesn't actually get dark until 9.15 PM during the summer. The dogs and I are on the couch and I've got my gaming headphones on while playing R2D2 online. All of a sudden, the dogs flip, running towards the back door and barking and growling. What the hell? They don't do this unless someone pulls up in their car and they don't know who it is, but I'm not having anyone over. I grab my knife, which is always located nearby and start walking towards the back door. The dogs are still going crazy and I have no idea what they're looking at. I don't see anything, but then I look closer. I see moped trail lights in the driveway seemingly hiding behind my car. I then try and focus in and see that Steve is turning around, staring at the back of his house from his moped, ducking behind my car. I get the dogs to be quiet and I hide to see what he's doing. The dogs are still growling, but at least they're not giving away my location right now. I was watching him for five minutes. Just a creepy stare in my general direction. I don't think that he can see me, but I'm unsure. He then shuts off his moped and crouches down next to my car, where I can see him now peeking into it. When I lived in the country, you see, I didn't ever lock my doors, not for my house, not my car or anything. Since I work and live downtown, naturally I keep all of my doors locked at all times. I didn't see him try and get into it, but he walks around it a few times. He's not crouching anymore. Obviously, he feels like no one's watching him or he doesn't care. He just is looking into my car and is only taking a single step, stopping, looking in my car, then at the house and repeat. It's creepy as hell. At this point, I text Terry and tell her that Steve is doing some really weird stuff and that I'm feeling super uncomfortable. I get a text back saying, call the cops if you feel unsafe. They know him. They can come and talk to him. Remind me to tell you about the time he was standing out of the street at 6 a.m. when I was leaving for work when we get back. We think he's had a psychotic break. How comforting, right? So I talk myself down. This guy is just wasted. However, if he starts getting close to the door, I'm calling the cops. Bad idea looking back because the cops take so long to get out there. I'm watching him as he's made his second round looking into my car. He then gets on his moped and drives off. As he passes the window that faces the driveway, he sped up, trying to make it so that I wouldn't see him if I were just watching TV. Now it's about 8 PM and the dogs start going crazy again. 
I look out, and now his moped is parked in plain view, and he's standing on the walkway just 30 feet from the house, staring and talking to himself. Now it's like 8pm, and the dogs start going crazy again. I look out, and now his moped is parked in plain view, and he's standing on the walkway, just 30 feet from the house, staring and talking to himself. I had previously turned all the lights off so that he couldn't easily see in and see what I was doing. I see him take a single step towards the door, now 29 feet away. I grab the firearm. I've calmed the dogs down and they are in full on protective mode. One dog to my left and one to my right. It's now 8.15 PM and I call the cops. I explain the situation and that the owners think he had a psychotic breakdown. As I'm halfway through explaining why I'm starting to fear for my safety, the operator says, Ma'am, what's your address again? I tell her, I'm sorry, ma'am, but you're not located in our county. I'll have to transfer you to Chow County. Are you serious? The owner said that the cops in South Spoon know him very well and know how to handle him. Isn't that you guys? Yes, ma'am, that is us, but you are located in a different county. That's not our jurisdiction. The guy who is bothering me lives in your county. That is why I'm calling you. The operator then transfers me to another county. When she answers the phone with the average 911, what's your emergency? I'm silent. I'm looking out the kitchen window and Steve has come up about four to five feet since the last time I looked out there. 911, what's your emergency? I then explain what's happening and explain that I was transferred because I'm apparently not in their jurisdiction. She tells me to remain calm, to turn all the lights on, and I said, screw that. The guy's waiting for me to do something like that. The doors are locked and I have a firearm. If he enters, I will shoot. She then tells me that it's safest with the lights on. I turn on the lights, he notices, and gets on his moped and drives back to his house. I tell her what happened. She asks if I would still like to have an officer come out. Hell yes, I want one to come out. Apparently the cops in the neighboring jurisdiction know him, but the lady transferred me to you. This is the third time he's come onto the property and he's getting closer and closer to the door. I do not feel safe. Someone that is not me needs to talk to this guy. Calm down, ma'am. We'll send someone. However, based on your location, it may take a while for someone to get out there. That's fine, I say. Just please have someone out here as quickly as you can. I ask her if she would stay on the line until he got here. And she says that one's on their way, but she needs to be available if someone else calls in. She told me that if he comes back and I'm uneasy to call them without hesitation. By this point, it's now nine. The sun is getting ready to set completely. Again, the dogs go crazy. And now I'm getting really pissed off from walking around the house with a loaded weapon. So that if Steve sees me, he'll see the firearm as well. I look out the window and see his moped, but I don't see him. Where is he? From the window in the kitchen, I can't see the back door. So I go upstairs with one dog following the other is too old to climb the stairs and peek through the window. Steve is on the back porch, lighting matches and throwing them down onto the wooden porch. He doesn't seem harmless anymore. He's talking to himself and twisting his head back and forth like he's getting warmed up for a fight or having a conversation with another one of his personalities. I start filming him from the upstairs window just in case so that I can hide my phone and when they found it, they know who they'd be looking for. The sun is down and it starts to get dark. He steps up the door and begins to knock. He then starts pounding on the door and I'm pretty good at staying calm in this situation, but my heart is beating so fast. My Fitbit had to change my heart rate tab every two seconds. If he gets in here, I'm going to have to use this firearm. I could see pure hate in his eyes. 
He then stops pounding at the door, quickly turns away and runs to his moped, starts it and takes off faster than I thought the moped could go. Not a minute later, the cop pulls into the driveway. I had mentioned to the dispatch operator that I have two dogs who will bark at the officer but will not attack unless given a specific word. They are trained and that I have a firearm that I will leave when I go meet the officer. I met the officer, the dogs didn't growl and simply gave a single bark a piece to let me know that someone was there. I went outside to meet him and told him the guy just took off moments ago on the moped. Oh yeah, I think I passed him when I turned onto the road. I explained that he is either drunk or crazy. And if he sees him on his way back, he should definitely pull him over because I'm quite positive he's under the influence of something. Normal people don't just act that way. The cop basically shrugs everything off and says, Well, are you going to stay here the night? I told him no. I leave the dogs overnight and come back in the morning. I asked him to stay while I packed everything up and he nodded. I go inside, give the dogs love and treats and crate them for the night and take off and return the next day with my dad. My dad begins walking the perimeter to try and show him that a man is also staying here. I'm a 24 year old female, by the way, if you were wondering. Then Steve wearing the same dirty outfit and hat while holding a 24 case of Budweiser is standing at the end of the driveway again. I'm watching him from the front window and I see my dad at the other end of the yard as he comes into view and Steve turns around and walks back to his house. I later learned that Steve had been to jail multiple times due to domestic abuse. His kids are not allowed to see him due to his violent nature and he bought a four wheeler no one knows how he gets his money to these things. Terry and John have never seen him leave for work. They've only seen him leave on his moped for four wheelers empty handed for an hour or two and then return with a load of beers a while later. I don't know who he thought I was, but every time he looked at the house in my direction, there was just pure malice in his eyes. Who knows what would have happened if I hadn't have called the cops as early as I did. When dog sitting from now on, if a neighbor says, hi, my answer is, let's not meet. I'm an avid hiker, and when I can't make the hours plus long drives up to the mountains, I enjoy nice hikes near my home. This one particular hike near my home is five miles in many different directions, like a goosebumps book of sorts for hiking. You can only see the trees and the greenery on one hike or a massive waterfall on another. Follow the river on another or see the abandoned and dilapidated mills from decades ago on a different one. I went to the waterfall this time. I was about two and a half miles in and I sat and did some work enjoying the serenity. When I was ready to leave, I looked around and saw a family of father, mother and three kids nearby. I packed my things back into my day pack as they left. I am a major people hater. I prefer to hike in areas where there are no people for miles. I choose to go a different way back to the trailhead than the way I came because I didn't want to run into this family for the next two and a half miles. I checked my map on my cell phone and found a route that I could take that seemed remote enough. I immediately noticed that this trail was not man-made, but just probably what was left after some flooding. It was going up river away from the waterfall. And I was so close to the river, all I had to do was walk out on a bent tree and I could touch the water. It was a very thin trail, not big enough for people to walk side by side on and was covered in thick roots. I enjoyed this, it was peaceful. I passed some girls who had hooked up hammocks to read about 20 feet to the right after I had hiked this little path for a while. And I had nothing but the sound of slow flowing river to my left until I heard lots of footsteps coming from behind me. I didn't want to deal with people behind me. So I stepped out onto a tree that hung over the river and waited for them to pass. 
It was that family from the waterfall. I could have sworn they went in the completely opposite direction. But whatever. I waited a few minutes before I began walking again, as I didn't want to run into them. Pretty soon their voices disappeared in the distance, and I was able to go back to enjoying the peace and beauty around me. I hiked for another five or so minutes when I had to turn a sharp corner around a boulder at a major bend in the river. This man, the father, was standing there on the other side, crouched down like he wanted to scare me. I screamed and he laughed. I got angry and noticed that his family were no longer where we were. What's wrong with you? Not bothering to control my anger at being snuck up on by some stupid idiot, but he wouldn't stop laughing. I realized I was dealing with a moron, maybe a psychopath, and I didn't want to deal with him either. So I turned around and booked it. I could hear him behind me following. He wasn't a very big man, maybe five foot six, 180 pounds, but he was keeping pace about 20 feet behind me. Let me tell you that this path is not for running. I very nearly went sideways into the river a few times, but this gave me a few ideas too. The routes I could mostly handle, I knew the terrain and the park pretty well, as long as I focused on my quick paced steps around the thick root system, and keeping my balance, I could make it. I was running back towards the waterfall, where surely there would be people around. It was a straight shot, but then I remembered the hammock girls, and I remembered that they were slightly hidden, and if I picked up speed, the dude behind me would miss me turning because of the natural curves in this path. I sprinted on the trail and burst into the hammock girl's area. I spotted a quick and quiet explanation, man following me, and they hid me behind the lowest hammock. It took us about five to 10 seconds maximum to get it set up, and the three of us watched to see if this guy ran past, as I would be hidden safely. I stayed with the girls for a few more minutes after he had passed explained the situation and catching my breath, and then went back the way I came up river, as I didn't want to run into this dude again. You think it's over, right? No. I again hiked up river on the trail, my original remote path back to the trailhead. I tried to calm myself down. I couldn't get my mind to stop thinking that I was being followed. I just tried to hurry and get out of there as fast as I could. I turned a sharp right at the boulder that the man was hiding behind before, and I kept pushing through the rough trail, and I tried to focus on the sound of the river that was still to my left, but I couldn't get the sound of my heart out my ears. The sound of my pounding heart morphed into the sound of footsteps in an instant, and I realized I was being followed once more. I looked back, and guess who? This damn guy again. I got mad as hell, stopped and turned around and yelled at him to stop following me. I yelled profanities and I threw a damn pine cone at him. He just smiled with a toothy grin and kept walking slowly towards me as it bounced off his shoulder. He wasn't phased by it. He just kept smiling. What he did not know was that I am an army combat veteran and a domestic violence survivor. I have PTSD from both and have skills that many don't. The dude chose the wrong girl to mess with that day. I'd had enough. I already hate people enough, but this guy was crossing a million lines. So I charged him. He finally wiped that look off his face, and I was seeing red, because I will not be made to feel unsafe in the only place I felt safe since I got a divorce and went to war. Seriously. I ran directly at him, knocked him down with the force of my body crashing into him, and screamed at him and hit him blindly. I grabbed his hair at the waistband of the back of his pants and started dragging him to the edge of the trail. He was the one yelling at me this time. Every time he fought back, I gave him a swift kick, and gave him several explanations for why his behavior was uncalled for. And then, I unceremoniously kicked him into the river and told him to cool off and not come out until I was gone. I turned back in the direction I had been walking in before, and decided that I needed to take another detour, just to be safe getting away from him. That also 
was to get away from more people. I knew there was a trail parallel to this one that I was on to my right, and I looked around for a clear place to climb up the steep hill, which was mostly granite and moss and ivy. I hadn't planned on impromptu rock climbing that day, but whatever, I found a spot and began climbing until I got scared by the three guys sitting in the middle of the hill on a very small mossy flat smoking weed. They were quite hidden. And once I caught my breath from the shock and climbing, I asked if they heard me screaming, and they said they did, but they thought I had it covered. I rolled my eyes and told them to kick anyone down the hill that tried to follow me, and continued on. It took me a while to cover the two and a half miles back to the trailhead that day, taking detours and hiding randomly. But when I did, I called the cops and alerted the park ranger about the guy. I don't know any other details on that, the cop laughed and said, good for you when I told him what I did. Honestly, I doubt they did much because I never heard back. And I sadly have not been back to that place. I just want to state before I share this, that I don't agree with violence, but I wasn't getting out there without it. I just want to hike in peace, and I would absolutely prefer it if I could do it alone and safely. And thank Cheez-Its for those hammock girls. The incident I'm going to share with you is all about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. This happened in North Pole, Alaska. No one believes it was unprovoked. I was in the army, and if you live in barracks, you have to keep your weapons in the army room. So it's not like it's convenient to get that out and carry, compared to a guy living off post who can keep his gun in a safe in a closet. I know people will still wonder why I wasn't carrying those. But anyway, here's my story. On the night of El Cinco de Mayo, I attended a party at a friend's house in North Pole, Alaska. North Pole is about half hour outside of Fairbanks. It's a somewhat rural community. Lots of houses that are on one to two acre lots and mostly all dirt roads off the main road. I was the designated driver that night and drove four of my friends, but three of the friends that I bought decided they were gonna spend the night at that person's house instead of returning to the barracks. Only one friend that wasn't drinking a lot decided that he wanted to go to the barracks when I was ready to go. We ended up leaving at 1.30 a.m. As we're pulling into the front gate, we got a call that there had been a fight at the party. They said after the fight, everyone was going home instead of staying the night and continuing to drink. So they asked us to come back and pick them up, but said that they had went to a different friend's house that lived in the same area because everyone had to leave after the fight. Well, GPS doesn't work that well once you get outside of Fairbanks, and aren't on the main roads, at least not with my Verizon service that night. You could get to the general area, but not the exact location. When we went to the address that was given, it came up as being in the middle of the road. So we took a turn down a side road so that we could get service in order to make the call and figure out which house it was. It was 2.30 at this point. As we turned down the road, there was an old red minivan with fog lights mounted on top, just idling, and two guys that looked to be in their late twenties inside. I remember thinking that it looked like something you'd see in a TV show or horror movie, just a really creepy looking van, especially at almost three in the morning. We had to pass them to turn around, and they looked at us in a way that gave us a very bad feeling. So we turned around and had to pass them again to pull out onto the main road. As we passed them, the driver was leaning his head out of the window like he wanted us to stop so that he could ask us something. Being that it was almost 3 a.m., we knew it was probably best to continue driving. My friend wasn't able to get hold of anyone, so he tried mapping it out again, but the GPS was delayed 
due to poor service, and we missed the turn again. We saw a small clearing to pull over, so we pulled over on the side of the road to verify where we were compared to the street we missed. About 10 seconds after, the same red minivan with the fog lights mounted pulled up next to us on my driver's side and rolled down the window. This time, I rolled mine down, and they initiated the conversation by asking if we had seen a white Dodge pickup. We said we hadn't, and they thanked us. And we asked if they knew where Meadow Rue, the street we were looking for, was located. They said it was the first street on the left if we headed back the way we came. We were suspicious, but when we looked at the GPS, it showed that it was that road. We found out later that the road was on both sides of the main road. Note, locals outside of Fairbanks tend to not like the active duty military guys, and military guys stick out a lot due to the lack of beard and long hair, and having a military haircut. We started heading towards Meadow Rue, which was about half mile away, and saw them pull out and start heading out that way behind us. We made the turn into what we thought was Meadow Rue, and this road is a bumpy dirt road and immediately forks off into two directions. One side goes straight and up a slight hill, and the other side is off to the left and drops down about two feet and flattens out. We turned left and dropped down the small incline. The road was narrow, only big enough for one car, and lined with trees on both sides for a good distance. The first thing we noticed was a dead end sign, and that's when we started to get worried. We drove about 20 feet, and then we see the minivan with fog lights turn in and drop down behind us. At this point, my blood turned cold, and I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach. I knew at this point that they were following us. I tried to be positive and hoped for a split second that they'd be hanging back and turn off at the first driveway, which we hadn't even seen yet. But then I saw them speeding up. Again, this is a bumpy dirt side street and there's no reason to be going fast. I started speeding up too, and they slammed into the back of my car, backed off and rammed me again. A few seconds later, we made it to a small clearing in a little dirt cul-de-sac. I had enough room to pull forward and then reverse myself back so that I was facing the direction I had just came. While I was doing this, they stopped and blocked the one lane dirt road. They hopped out the car and shouted, this ain't Meadow Rue, get out the car. The one guy had positioned himself directly in front of my car, 10 to 15 feet away between the trees and his van. The other guy started walking up to my passenger side where my friend was. They kept shouting at us to get out. I just gunned it right at the guy in front of me trying to run him over. He managed to jump out of the way. I thought for sure there wasn't going to be enough room between his van and the trees, and figured we'd get stuck. But we had no weapons, so there wasn't a better choice. I thought we'd have to bail out and run into the woods and hide. But to my surprise, we squeezed through. It was such a tight fit that both my mirrors collapsed in, and then I sped out of there, got onto the main road and headed home. I had seen a state trooper not long before this, not too far down the road. I was scared to death of being chased again, and then run off the road at higher speed. So instead of slowing down, I blew past the state trooper, doing 90 and a 45. Since this is extreme speeding, I would thought I'd get the trooper's attention, but for whatever reason, I didn't. There was only one turn on the whole way back, and when I slowed down to make it, the van was nowhere in sight. I still flew back at 90 all the way back, just to be safe. The next day, we tried to tell our friends what had happened. Nobody believed us, not one person. They thought we didn't feel like driving all the way back to pick them up, so we made up some story to get out of it. The guy who had invited us all over originally 
said that if we were serious that we needed to go file a police report with the Alaska State Troopers. So we went to do that. When we filed the report after giving our story to the trooper, he told us to wait and then left the room. About 15 minutes later, he came back in and told us to tell the truth. Confused, we asked him what he meant. And he said his theory was that we were drunk, driving around late at night after the Cinco de Mayo party, and we plowed into the van we described. He said he thought the owner heard that happen, and then came out and confused, so we took off. He said to get ahead of the story, we made up the whole thing so we wouldn't get in trouble for wrecking into the car while drunk and leaving the scene. We repeatedly told him this was not the case and said everything that we told him was true. Without evidence to prove his theory though, he let us go. The next day he went and checked the area we showed him on the map. I guess when he didn't find a wrecked car, he knew we were most likely telling the truth. He called and asked us to come meet him out there to verify it was the area. But we told him we didn't want to go near there again. About two weeks later after that, he called and asked us to come back in and possibly ID the vehicle. He showed us a picture of a red minivan with fog lights and we said that it looked like the vehicle from the incident. He told us that this vehicle was stolen out of Neneka, Alaska, some time before that, and it was stolen from an old woman. The guys may or may not have been related to her, and the trooper said if any arrests were made, he would call us back. But we never heard any follow up after that. To this day, no one really believes my story. They think we did something to provoke the incident or just made it up to sound cool or whatever. But it was just a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. In spring of 2015, I at barely 18 years old, took five of my friends, all girls, to what is known as Bunny Man's Bridge in Fairfax. You may be wondering what is Bunny Man's Bridge, and I'm going to enlighten you. The story goes that in 1904, there was an asylum not too far from this bridge. The residents nearby didn't like the idea of mental patients living nearby. So they protested and got it shut down. And all the patients were taken by bus to Lawton Prison. The bus swerved and crashed. They were able to locate all inmates bar one. The escaped mental patient's name was Douglas Griffin. After the crash, he vanished. Weeks passed and rabbit corpses began appearing in the woods. Douglas was apparently eating bunnies to stay alive. And this went on for a while. Then, one Halloween night, a group of kids were hanging around the bridge and they reported seeing something strange. And then in a flash, they had all been strung up like the bunnies, gutted and hanging from the bridge. The missing mental patient was of course assumed to be the one responsible. And the rumor goes, that if you come here on Halloween night at midnight, you will end up just like those poor children. That is the urban legend. It was a Monday, maybe 9pm when we showed up. And I wanted to get out and climb up and walk along the railroad tracks that run over the bridge, as I had done that plenty of times in the past. I pulled the keys out of the ignition and sat for a minute telling them the tale of the bunny man, at which point they kind of got freaked out and decided to stay in the car. We sat there and kept talking for five minutes until someone in the back seat gasped and froze staring out the back window on my side of the car. I turned to my right to look at her and saw everyone else's faces freeze in horror and the girl right behind me yelped as I realized what was happening. I turned my head the other way to see who must be approaching when someone started pounding on the back window. 
and continued as they moved up towards my door. I turned just in time to see a man with a huge white dog come up and rip my door open as it was still unlocked from before when I was planning to get out. And for a second, he just stood there and stared at me. He was visibly enraged. He started telling me this was private property, and that we were trespassing. And before I had a chance to tell him we'd leave, he started yelling at me to get out of the car. I was like, No, we're just gonna leave. At that point, he loses his mind, starts yelling in my ear. And I think he saw my keys sitting on my lap, because he tried to grab them. But I pushed his arm away and started yelling profanities while my friends in the passenger seat gasped loudly. He stepped back for a second, and looked up and down, and then started eyeing the big metal cop flashlight I keep under my seat, and tried to grab that too. But fortunately, his dog was off doing his own thing. It was actually a cute dog that seemed rather friendly. And the leash pulled his arm away long enough for me to grab the door handle. He caught it just before it shut, and was trying to force it back open saying he was going to call the police. And I think I said, likewise, and finally thought to grab my keys with my free hand and start the car. I drove off while he was still holding the handle, and then closed it once he couldn't keep up and had to let go. I watched him in the mirror as he sped away. And it really freaked me out that he'd let go of the leash and began sprinting after us until he knew he couldn't catch us up. At which point, he just let out a deep primal scream, just as we passed under the bridge. It looked like he was bending down to pick something up, maybe a rock. But we cleared the corner before he could throw anything. I told my dad about it when I got home and he made me call the police to report it. And the woman at the station actually sounded pretty concerned, which is something I wasn't expecting. After that, I read up all these stories about the legendary bunny man, and lots of them described a crazy man yelling about trespassing and stuff, which was already enough to freak me out. But what's really wild is the guy could kind of match up with some of the descriptions given in the other reports. Although they all sounded like pretty generic white guy descriptions. So it shouldn't have been that shocking. What made it so confusing was that he didn't look crazy or dangerous. He was maybe five at 10, white, mid 50s, looking quite fit and healthy, and was wearing a flannel shirt, jeans and a baseball cap. Aside from the psycho behavior, he actually might have been kind of hot. Also, the dog threw me off because of how totally friendly and docile it seemed. I still can't figure out where he would have walked up from. I'd been checking my mirrors and peripherals the whole time we were parked there, up to the moment of the first girl gasped. All I can think of was that he must have walked straight out of this bamboo forest that's on the right as you come out of the other side of the narrow tunnel, running through under the bridge. We turned around and were facing the bridge from the other side. So this bamboo was on our left. And the whole rest of the immediate area is so thickly forested, aside from a long wide concrete driveway to our right just in front of us. I never heard back from the police about it. I've gone back there a few times since it happened. But I won't ever park and sit around again. I just drive friends through the bridge who haven't seen it before and then turn around and leave. All in all, it made for a pretty fitting campfire story. But I still wonder what he would have done if I'd stepped out the car, or he'd have gotten a hold of the nightstick flashlight. The only logical explanation is that he's a resident sick of kids playing down there. Which I get. But to say he overreacted is an understatement. Not to mention he completely fed into the law of the crazy man yelling at trespassers. I can only think of a handful of times I've ever seen someone so overcome with fury, especially over something so trivial. It was so unreal when he first started yelling. I wondered if he was maybe just a normal level of upset, but also socially 
maladroit, or maybe mentally challenged, until he tried to grab at my keys. That is flying off the handle. There's no moral to this story. Maybe carry some sort of protection in future. But in any case, Bunny Man, or whoever you are, let's not meet again. My parents had a business running cabins in the middle of nowhere. People would rent them out for a small amount of time and then leave. It was their job to make sure that they were cleaned and ready for the next people, to market them and have people come and stay every once in a while. It was quite far to the nearest town, at least a 40 minute drive every day to and from school and for groceries and the like, but my parents loved being out there. I was an only child at the time, as they simply were far too busy with their business to even entertain the possibility of giving me a sibling, which now in later years I can respect having a child of my own. It was here, out in the middle of nowhere, where my love for nature grew. There were so many interesting things to see, and my parents being far too busy to pay me the attention I needed to as a growing child, let me wander off by myself, with only a handful of rules to adhere to. Don't be back too late, which was never specific, but usually meant before sundown, to make sure I was there for dinner, amongst a few other smaller things. There was a part of the forest that I absolutely loved going to. It was a trail that I had made myself, worn it down with my own footfalls, and I tried to keep it as hidden as possible. It was my own private slice of heaven, my tranquility, my peace, and although my parents knew about it, they hardly ever went there, unless, perhaps, they needed to find me urgently. It was on one of these days where I made my way down the trail, I had started to build myself a little den from sticks. It was quite hard to find the appropriate sticks, and at 12 years old, I wasn't a master builder. But I did enjoy trying to gather up whatever I could to make a wannabe shelter, just so that I could read my books, or listen to music in peace, or perhaps just listen to the sounds of nature, look around and watch the animals undisturbed. It was on a day like this, the middle of summer, and prime time for rentals, that I was just chilling on my lawn chair in my den in the middle of nowhere. That's when I hear rustling up on my trail. I look around and see a man, fat, bearded, very, very tall, stumble his way through the trail. He let out a sharp cry of pain as he pricked himself on one of the brambles coming through. You see, my path was ideal for someone of my height and stature, but for a taller person there are parts that were a little bit uncomfortable. As he approached me, he asked me what I was doing there. He had a tone in his voice that almost made him sound like he was the owner of these woods, and as I didn't know if it was just national property, or if it did indeed have an owner, I started to get scared. What if I wasn't allowed here anymore? I asked him who he was, and he said that he indeed did own this part of the forest. He looked at me up and down and asked what I was doing there. I told him that I was sorry, and that I just liked coming here. I didn't want him to think that I was doing anything bad like building a den on his property. So when he looked down at the bundle of sticks, he asked what I was trying to do. And I told him that I was trying to build a little den. He laughed, and the conversation got a bit more lighthearted. He said that when he was younger, he also liked building dens out in the forest. I asked if I could keep trying to build mine, and he gave me a little nod and said it would be okay. That's when things got a bit creepy. He put a condition. He said, how about you let me play with you now, and then you can keep coming back to your den. No problem, no questions asked. 
I didn't really understand what he meant. I assumed just play together building the den, so I shyly nodded, but I was getting very scared. Part of me just wanted to bolt and run, but I wanted to keep coming here, and I was torn. I look up into his eyes, and I'll never forget. There was a hungry look in them, almost predator-like, like I was his prey and he was tracking me down, ready to devour me. All of a sudden, a surge of fear shot through me. He said, getting closer towards me, that he really enjoyed playing with little girls. At that moment, my heart stopped beating and I knew I needed to leave. I bolted without another word, abandoning my lawn chair and a handful of other things I had littered about and just ran for it. It took me about seven minutes to get back home, which was a lot faster than the usual 14, 15 minutes it took to get there in the first place. I arrived through the door, panting and babbling to my mum. She calmed me down after about 10 minutes and I finally asked her if the forest belonged to someone. She said that the forest was part of the cabin site and that anyone could go through there as it was owned by my parents and came as part of the business. I was relieved and then said, so who's the man who said he owned the woods? She gave me a confused look and asked me what he looked like. I described him in great detail down to the dirty green plaid shirt he was wearing. That's when my mother got a very strange look on her face and walked away, telling me, I'll be right back, honey, just wait here, okay? She went to get my dad, who was cleaning one of the other properties, preparing it for rentals later in the day. They had a conversation and came back. My dad asked me to confirm if it was indeed the guy who I was telling her about, and I said it was. They looked at each other and told me not to worry about it, smiled, and that was the end of that. I never saw the man again, and I was very grateful for that. But part of me always wondered who he was. Sadly, I was too scared to go back into the forest for about two years, and after that, I finally made my way through again. I had to make my trail once more, and as I was getting older, my interest started to dwindle being outside, and I began focusing more on hanging out with my friends. But I still used it every now and again, just to chill, or maybe to go there with my buddies. However, this story does have a resolution. It wasn't until years later, where the spot had finally become a nice little chill place for when my friends were around, that we were all telling each other scary stories. My best friend, Ashley, was telling me about something spooky that had happened to her. And that's when, being at the exact spot where it had all occurred about eight years ago, do I tell her and the rest of my friends my story with the creep right where they're sitting. They all look aghast and ask what he looked like. I give them a brief description and one of them says, could it really be? And then cuts off. She says she doesn't remember his name, but later that evening goes back to her house and gets on the internet and shows me a picture the next day. This was when cell phones were just coming out and sending picture messages had to be done through text and cost a fair amount of money on your phone operator back then. When the picture comes through, I can confirm it was indeed the man. She'd been doing some research online and it turns out that he was a predator who stalked our area and neighboring towns a number of years ago. He was convicted after he was found guilty of doing something terrible with a young child. And after that was sent to prison. I can't believe how close I was, how in danger I was that one time. In any case, I'd rather not meet him again. We live in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. 
The closest neighbour is about 900 metres away by road, and 600 if you cut through their forest. We have lived here for quite some time, and never really had that much of a problem with the neighbours. My mum has four large dogs, two being Alaskan Malamutes, one Husky Malamute mix, and one German Shepherd Malamute mix. They bark at things they see. If they see hunters or deer or moose on the far side of the field next to our house, or whether it's a car, driving or people walking down our road, they bark loudly. And when I say our road, I mean our road. It's about 200 meters long and leads only to our house and away from it, with no other properties. One of the dogs is inside at nights. Two are inside a fenced area and one is outside the fenced area, on a chain leash connecting to her doghouse. They really are the sweetest dogs and wouldn't hurt a fly. Well, maybe a fly, but never people. They do have a large problem with running away though, meaning that if they somehow got loose, they stay loose for a few hours roaming other people's property, unless you catch all of them back within seconds. They come back on their own after maybe three to five hours, but we try to find them and catch them before they cause any harm on others. One night, around 3am, my dad gets a phone call from a blocked number. Being all groggy and literally just waking up, he answers it. The male voice on the other end says aggressively, make your dog shut up before I call the police and animal control. My dad apologizes and the other person hangs up. My dad got up worried and goes to check on the dogs. I know you're getting ahead of yourselves, but our dogs are still there. They all seem to have just woken up when my dad walked out. And now he's being a bit annoyed, as he's being threatened for no reason at all. So if they had been barking, the police couldn't find him, and animal control couldn't either, considering the dogs were healthy. A month passes and we all forget the strange call. The next occurrence may not even be by the same person, but I wouldn't be surprised. My parents get up, make coffee and go out for a cigarette as they normally do. They sat there for a moment until they saw one of our dogs laying on the porch next to them. The dog watched at them with guilt in his eyes and as soon as our other dog came running from behind the house, wagging its tail happily, the third dog on the chain leash started howling. At this point, my parents went to check to see if they had closed the door poorly. The fenced area was quite large, built with thick metal net supported by poles, about 2.5 meters tall. The door was a frame with the same metal net, but strengthened with a piece of tin paneling at the bottom because the dogs have once wiggled through it. But the problem wasn't the door. They hadn't dug their way out or magically jumped their way, no. In the back of a fence, there was a large hole cut with metal cutters. Around the hole were muddy footprints and my parents called the police after taking the dogs in. Somehow the police didn't see the problem and said that it was likely the dogs that had chewed their way out. Those words literally came out of their mouths. Our third dog was probably not let out because she has the meanest spark you'll ever hear. She literally will roll over if you go closer. But the culprits didn't know that, so they went from the back. My dad bought a hunting camera. Unfortunately, no one went there again. Maybe the scariest part of them being let out of the pens is that it was hunting season and a hunter could have shot the dogs during the night. We once found a plastic bag with raw meat outside our dog pen. Obviously it was thrown out immediately, but it still creeps me out. And the whole ordeal is just so weird. Maybe it was a messed up prank and the consequences were unclear to those doing it. Maybe they tried to catch the dogs, but they were too fast and strong. Maybe they wanted to send a message like that maniac, but it certainly made us feel on edge for a while.
This happened fairly recently. My boyfriend and I were spending a night camping just to get away from it all. We had got comfortable in our tents and had gotten to sleep. It must have been about 4am or so. And I was awoken by rustling near our tent. There aren't many big animals where we live. So I was unsure what exactly it could be. Being the curious gal I am, I glanced at my watch and knew that it had to be an animal. I didn't want it getting too close. So I thought I'd sneak my head out as I knew there was nothing dangerous in this area, just to maybe frighten it away in case it wanted to try and nibble on our tent. So I stand up, make my way out the tent and look around. There's nothing. But I listen intently in the dark. And then I hear it again. A little animal getting closer and closer. The footfalls are more pronounced. And as I look behind our tent to see where it's coming from, I hear it run off into the distance. I was quite happy with that, thinking whatever it was must have seen me and gotten scared. So I pull back the flap, do the zipper back up and make my way back to my sleeping bag next to my snoring boyfriend who hadn't even noticed that I'd gotten up to scare that animal away. I try going back to sleep, but there's an uneasiness in the air now. And I'm starting to feel uncomfortable. Part of me is trying to convince myself. It's simply just the material and that I don't feel super comfortable sleeping like a sardine. But deep down, I know it isn't true. That encounter, despite the fact nothing happened, has unsettled me ever so slightly. And I feel that there's just something wrong. Unable to sleep, it being nearly 5am now, knowing that the light will be up soon, I decide that I'm just gonna sit out in the dark and listen to scare away anything that comes near. And hopefully, by the time it's light, I feel safe enough to go back to sleep as my boyfriend is a heavy sleeper. And I know that he'll be asleep till late or so. So there I sit waiting for the first rays of light to give me comfort in the morning. But then the rustling returns, the footfalls come back, this time more rushed. I look around and still can't see anything. And when I hear nothing for about five minutes, do I finally think it's gone? But that's when I hear it. It's not right besides my tent. It's right behind me now. I quickly turn my head in a super fast way and see a man on all fours wearing dirty clothes. He almost looks like a rat. He gives me this creepy smile, stands on his legs and in an instant is running off into the woods. He hides behind a tree and starts peeking out like I hadn't noticed him almost like this is a game. I just about soil myself. And I immediately yell Martin to get my boyfriend's attention. He didn't wake up. So I keep on screaming. Rat man is just there in his rags staring at me hungrily from behind the tree. I wanted this creep to know that I was with someone and that if he did anything, there would be hell to pay. That's when I hear a very groggy what from my tent. And I'm getting a bit angry now. I really need his assistance. So I yell at him to come here now and that there's a strange man outside. The words seem to perk him up as he dashes outside. What I hadn't realized is that my boyfriend likes to sleep in the nude. And then there's him naked with rat man staring from behind a tree. Not that my boyfriend seemed to notice he was far too focused on this creep. When I point in the direction of the strange man, my boyfriend is still adjusting his eyes and can't see him yet as it's still very dark. The moon only partially illuminating where we're at. He rubs his eyes and then we hear him run again. I've lost track of him. My boyfriend is now angry, starts screaming to come here and face us like men. And then at that moment, the rat man comes running towards my boyfriend with a stick. 
my boyfriend just manages to avoid being smashed in the head, and the rat man somehow trips. My boyfriend takes the opportunity to pin him down, punches him in the face a few times, and asks him what the hell he's doing trying to scare us in the middle of the night. The rat man doesn't say anything, just spits in my boyfriend's face. My boyfriend, in a fury, stands up, kicks him, and tells him to leave, and that if he ever comes anywhere near our clearing, there'd be hell to pay. The creep, slowly, walked away into the distance, looking back and swearing. None of us have any idea what he was doing out here in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. We were too afraid at this point to do anything else, so we pack up our stuff and leave just as the first rays of sunshine are making their way through the dark. To this day, I still don't like camping. I'm Ratman wherever you are. Let's not meet again. My family and I were driving from Ohio to Wyoming one holiday season to visit family about 10 years ago. Due to storms further north, we traveled straight west instead of northwest at first and split the trip at Ohama, staying the night before heading up through Nebraska into South Dakota. Once we were far enough north, we turned west onto I-90. At that point, it might have been over an hour since we saw anywhere that might have a public restroom, and we were on state routes, so no rest areas. Those of you who have traveled with young kids know that's close to their bladder slash boredom limit, and our daughter was begging us to stop somewhere to pee. South Dakota was similarly deserted or even worse as we headed west. Finally, we reached a desperately needed rest stop as my at the time five-year-old and I both needed to pee by then. Just as we pulled in, the truck that had been following us for a while pulled in too. I didn't think too much of it at first until I started to open my door. My head was turned to the right where the truck was parked a couple of spots over. My eyes met the driver and I just shivered. He was a skinny guy, straggly gray brown beard and dark eyes. I could see that he was wearing a dingy, dirty blue plaid shirt, and he got out of his 90s brown and cream truck and started rummaging in the bed. I told my husband I didn't want to go into the rest stop alone because of the guy and the weird feeling I got from him. He thought I was being a little silly, but agreed to come in with us. And at that point, the next stop was Wall, South Dakota, at least a hundred miles away, according to the huge billboards we passed advertising it. He figured he better empty his bladder, even though he didn't particularly feel the need to. I grabbed our daughter, and we headed inside, followed by the guy who'd finished rummaging at his truck, but wasn't carrying anything when I glanced back. My daughter and I did our business in the women's restroom, and headed back out to the lobby. As I expected, my husband was already out there since he didn't have a small human to chaperone. The older guy was also in the tiny lobby area. He was just there, glaring at my husband. My husband rushed us back to our car, and as we were buckling in, he locked the doors. Then he told me that the guy hadn't even gone into the restroom and was just standing in the lobby the whole time. He agreed with me that we might have had a close call, and was glad that it hadn't just been me and our daughter there. However, that's not the end of the story. Remember how I mentioned Wall and that it was a hundred miles away? Well, that was a hundred miles of pretty landscapes, but a decent number of turnoffs from the interstate. We didn't see the truck following us, and through the whole episode was completely behind us except when we stopped in Wall to grab lunch and some road snacks. Plus, look around this homely but fun little tourist trap in the middle of nowhere. We saw the guy in the store not 20 feet from us, same face, beard, dirty plaid shirt. Thankfully, we'd already eaten. So since he was staring at us again, we quickly paid for our snacks and trinkets and got the hell out of there. We didn't see him again, but I was seriously creeped out until we reached our relatives in Wyoming safely, with no other sights of that accursed truck. 
I was hanging out with a guy once in my small rural town. One of the only things to do in this town are to listen to music, drive around old country roads and eventually find a quiet spot where you can park and chat. We call this road riding. And everyone does it. We were driving down a one lane road when we turned into some gravel road. The gravel eventually gave way to dirt until the dirt was just two tire tracks winding down the wood ahead of us. I asked him if he knew where he was going. And he assured me that he's been going to this spot for years. He was a really creative guy, always writing songs recording whatever projects were on his hand. Anyway, we were sitting in his car, just having a good time. And we reached the middle of this clearing. At this point, you can't even see semblance of a road. We were truly in the middle of nowhere. Once we park, he turns down the music and gets to talking. What started out as talking about life and love eventually turned into discussing higher powers and enlightenment. There's more, but it's been almost a year now and I honestly can't recall the entire conversation. He was talking about how limited most people are in their thinking and how he thinks there's so much more out there than what we've come across. Bear in mind it was about 1 or 2 am at this point, pitch black outside, and we had turned off all the headlights, and the only light was coming from the dimly lit radio, softly playing in the background. As he's talking, I start to feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up for no reason. I wasn't particularly creeped out by what he was talking about, and found it rather interesting. The air started to feel heavy, and my body became incredibly aware that we were not alone something was sharing that clearing with us. The atmosphere around us felt electric like something was manifesting itself. It was just a totally unnatural feeling that I've never experienced before. I felt the area succumb to overwhelming malice. About 30 seconds after I feel this way, he stops, looks at me and says, Can you feel that? I can't even speak. So I just nod. The moment I nod, the entire clearing is lit up with a bright light. It wasn't a flashlight, like a lightning bolt. It was lit for a good five seconds before fading out. And it was steady. We stare at each other in panic, and I finally shout to him, get out of here. He fiddles with the ignition to drive away. And the whole time, I just feel impending doom. I've never felt more like I was going to perish. Then at that moment, and there wasn't even a visible threat. I've dealt with anxiety my entire life. So I know what it's like to feel unnecessarily helpless all the time. My fight or flight reflexes go off on all cylinders randomly through the day. This was worse. This was the scariest moment of my life. I went from being totally happy that I was sitting in a car with this super good looking dude and fighting back sobs of terror. We made it out. And once we got to the main road, all he could say to me was, what was that? And my response was shake head paired with, I don't know. He dropped me off and we never spoke about it again. This is the first time I've brought it up since then. And I legitimately feel terrified and clam up every time I start to tell someone about it. I feel like whatever was in that clearing with us did not want us there. It did not want to talk to us about what we were doing. And it was giving us a warning. I should also mention that the radio turned off with the flash of a light. And we tried to drive away. And the car acted like the battery was dead for a moment before finally deciding to turn over. We hadn't been there long. So there's no way the car died as we're talking. And it seems super coincidental that it would just do that the moment the lights filled the clearing. This was a brand new car. I'm a 23 year old fat girl from England. This is an important detail. I'm also five foot five and was 19 at the time of this story. I used to walk my dog at night until this experience. 
Not the kind of dark where you can't see anything, but the kind where you can make out a fair bit, but not perfectly. This is what the area is like. Middle of nowhere. Everyone knows each other kind of village. Strangers or visitors are always spotted as they stand out. And a fair few of my neighbors walk late. And the neighbor I always meet while I'm out is usually this six foot three heavily tattooed 46 year old man with two very unfriendly big dogs, one massive German Shepherd. We were great friends and still are. The only other dog his wouldn't attack was mine. So I had no worries about that late hour, because he was normally just a shout away. This night I bumped into him, just ending his walk, which had happened a few times. I'm around half hour into my 45 minute walk in the woods. Earphones in, playing music, and just checking my phone for which song to play next. I notice my dog is looking up, as if he can see something. I assume it's another neighbor, fox or deer. My dog doesn't chase anything, so it was normal that he didn't run after any animal. I looked up calmly to see a strange man standing around 20 to 25 feet away from me, holding a rifle. Now, remember, this is England. So having a gun unless you're a farmer, let alone a rifle, is an extremely difficult task. He also didn't have a dog. And this isn't hunting season. He looked shocked but angry to see me there. At this point, I remember my head torch. And he turns to look at me. He angles himself to face me. And at this point, I knew I couldn't turn around or run since I'm very out of shape. More so then. So I carry on walking. As we go past, my dog gives him a wide berth, which is unusual since he's so friendly and loves literally everyone and everything. When I was level with him, he shuffled and just said, Evening. I responded with the usual good evening and sped walked out of there. Looking back over my shoulder as I was about to leave the woods, I saw he hadn't moved, just stood there looking at me. I never walked home again at night. This freaked me out so much because it's never happened again. And any hunting near me has to be done in a certain area at a certain time of year. He could have been hunting, but I'm sure I would have heard a gun go off at some point since sound travels and I can hear bird scarers and other fields through my earphones. For context, I didn't walk with the neighbor a lot because he was inconsistent with times due to work. And it had been safe with no issues in this area before. Creepy guy, let's not meet again. I'm from Slovakia, a little state in Central Europe. I had lived there for 20 years. And I never heard about this topic until quite recently. You see, there's a very strange forest in the westish part of the country named Tribec. First time I ever found out about the place was from a movie trailer about the topic. I was bamboozled when they wrote it was based on true events. Like this is a small country and people are kind of conservative. But anyway, nothing much ever happened in our country that I would consider paranormal by any means. I discovered that there's an almost Bermuda Triangle kind of place with a big twist. You see people mysteriously disappear, but they also appear weeks, even months later, in completely different locations disoriented with severe cuts and burns on their hands and legs. The cuts are completely different sizes and depths. It's important to mention, people are not always found. But if they are, this state of disorientation or insanity is very common. Allegedly, this little spot, this forest in the middle of nowhere, is full of crosses with scary unexplained pasts, abandoned villages left to decay, castle ruins no one can remember. 
It's a very favorite famous tourist attraction. But people, even though they know nothing about the place, are reporting feeling lost, disoriented, losing track of time, disappearing and reappearing in places they'd never been. They even start going missing. The season tends to happen between November and March. Even the Slovakian media covered these stories several times, but not frequently. The most famous case I can remember is about a German man named Walter Fischer. He went into the forest for a hike to Black Castle. He never returned, so his wife went to the police to search for him. And months didn't go by, but a year later he was found in another part of this forest, bleeding with several weird burns on his body. He was taken to hospital, and from there to a psychiatric unit, because he went totally bananas and was blabbering about lights that kept him company, about different dimensions, and other stuff like that. Bear in mind he was completely normal before he stepped foot into the forest. The latest story, as far as I'm aware, was from 2017, when a boy was lost and they found him after several weeks injured and fainted. He was brought to the hospital, but passed due to his injuries. He had cuts on his hands and bare feet, as he had somehow lost his boots. This is very strange and reminiscent of the 411 cases if you guys are familiar. All I'm saying is if you guys find yourselves in Slovakia, it might be best to stay out of the woods. I remember a time I was almost taken when I was a kid. I lived at my grandmother's house out in the middle of nowhere, Texas. Our neighbors lived closer to the main country road, and my grandmother's house was on the back of a five acre lot. Across the main street was an army depot, nothing but woods and yellow daffodils. My parents were at work, and my grandparents were in the house watching the Golden Girls. My father had bought me a bike as a birthday gift. I would just turned nine, so I was riding my bike up our long driveway. Our neighbor to the left, a really old elderly woman, had no one to visit her or speak to her. So I often played at her house and helped her with anything she asked me to. That day, I wanted to show her my new bike. She was sitting on her porch when I visited her. She had no errands or chores for me. So I talked to her for about 15 minutes and showed her my bike. When I returned to my own driveway, I had been riding back and forth for about 15 minutes, listening to music on my MP3 player when I had this sudden nauseating pain in my gut. I looked around, only to find a car passing by. I recognized it as my elderly neighbor's car and waved to her. She stopped long enough to talk to me, as she pulled into our driveway just far enough that the tail end of her car wasn't in the street. A white van marked with some electronic company's name and a ladder on the roof passed by. In our area, there was only one electricity company. The one on the truck wasn't it, so I found it strange. A good 10 minutes passed when I noticed the van was driving by again and going in the direction it had come from. Perhaps the person was lost, I thought, and kept speaking with my neighbor. She gave me a bag of her garden tomatoes and cucumbers for my grandmother before telling me to head home. I watched her as she drove away then that sudden pain returned, and I had forgotten all about it. I looked up to see the white van was driving in my direction, going much faster than it had been. Something inside me screamed to run, to do something, whatever it was, but I had to get away and do it fast. I dropped the bags in my hand, and ran across the small pasture to my elderly neighbor's house. She was no longer on the porch but her house was much closer than my grandmother's. As I hopped over the neighbor's fence, the van sped up as it cut into my neighbor's driveway. I made a quick decision to run up the back steps instead of running around the front of the house. 
my neighbour had a long wrap around the porch, and her driveway was small. If he had intentions on taking me, it would have been too easy for him to catch me, trying to run around the front of the house. I was in tears, as my neighbour locked her door and called the cops. She'd seen everything, and called my grandfather first. It would have taken way too long for the police to arrive. My neighbour put me in her room, and locked the door behind herself. Moments later, I hear banging on the front door. As terrified as I was, I looked out her bedroom window, to find a tall and lean man standing on the front porch. He looked like he might have been in his mid to late twenties. Dark hair, blue jumpsuit like Michael Myers, and he had aviator sunglasses on, and I could see he had a dark beard. He banged on the door once more, then began walking around the house. He was looking in the windows when my grandfather arrived. The very moment he saw him, the man ran back to the van, and sped off. I'm 25 now, and thankfully, never saw that van again. When I was six, my family and I went on vacation to Morocco. It was a very nice place. We visited a lot of different towns, and we even went to the beach to swim and have a nice beach day. In total, we stayed about three weeks. One of the weeks, we had a plan to rent a 4x4, and go into the desert to explore, and go to towns and resorts. So the first day of our desert expedition, we woke up early to the 4x4 and drive off into the desert. We would stop every 30 minutes or so to walk around a bit and play in the sand and take in the beauty. It was a very fun day. And that night we stayed in a hotel so we could leave early and do more exploring. The next day, we were driving along like normal. And then my parents wanted to stop for lunch in the middle of the desert. We had lots of food in our car, and my brother and I were happy to have time to go outside and play. We had lunch, packed up, and just when we were about to leave, we realised we're stuck. The 4x4 wouldn't move. It had sunk into the sand, and we were stuck there for about five hours. My family didn't seem to care much, but I was crying and freaking out, yelling for help. I thought we were going to die, even though we had enough food for days. Then, just when my parents were starting to get stressed, do we see a car in the distance? It was coming towards us. We were saved. The men from the car helped us get our car out the sand, and even offered to take us to an inn that belonged to their friend. We were very grateful. They drove us in their truck, towing our truck for a few hours, until we arrived to this inn in the desert. It was a very nice place, with traditional walls and nice scenery. My brothers and I went outside on a little sand dune to play in the sand, while my parents spoke with the men. They helped us make sure our car was running normally, and they were very nice and hospitable. We didn't think anything of it. I was playing outside when it got chilly, around 7pm, so I went back in to fetch a sweater. And when I went inside, I saw my dad hiding around the corner listening to the men speaking to each other in Arabic. I didn't think anything of it, so I went to get my sweater and went back outside. Night came and we went to bed. I was in a room with my mum and my brothers, were in the room next to me with my dad. At 2am my mum woke me up, told me to get dressed because she wanted to go on a little walk, and we left the room. We got my family, got in the car and left, and never went back. I didn't understand why, so I assumed we were just driving around, and we spent the rest of the vacation in towns. I didn't know this at the time, but my parents then told me the full story. My dad overheard the man talking about how someone would come pick us up in the morning, when my mum was sleeping, she said she saw a man with a knife come into our room and hide in our closet. They were human traffickers, who went around the desert rounding tourists up and selling them. I've had run-ins with cougars at an old farmhouse we lived at for a while. 
You could always tell because the nightlife would go silent, the bats would vanish, the foxes would go silent, even the tree frogs and crickets would be quiet. It started with nearby cows going out, then it was like a blob of audible darkness as everything hid from the big cat. Now here's a creepier story. The same thing happens when a big feral hog is wandering solo at night. Same place, we let our dogs run loose at the night for exercise. Sometimes they came home with a raccoon or armadillo. This one particular night, they came home hauling full tilt boogie on the back porch. My dogs fear nothing because they're dumb. So when they run from something, I step inside for a handgun. So when they run from something, I know it's bad and I head inside for protection. The dogs were emboldened. So with my wife behind me and our dogs scouting ahead, where the dogs are barking like they see something, it was the opposite. It was stuck under the chain link fence. Pig squash. It was the size of a bass boat. I grunted and my old dog took off the porch. I told my wife to head for the house and I would be there soon. The hog had uprooted the concrete set posts. It was looking at me and I was looking at Ham. I backed away and one step at a time, if I tripped, he would have eaten me like I eat Ham. When I got to the porch, my wife had my weapon ready and I told her to keep it for when I was MIA. I know what you're thinking and you're right. Nothing happened because the pig was long gone. The next day I went to try and estimate the damage to the fence. But the only sign of the hog was a bunch of bristle and a trashed fence. I went on a backpacking trip in some youth program in the Northern Cascades near Seattle. One of us got hurt by a falling rock on our way to base camp. So I had to help carry him back to the trailhead while accompanied by one of the leaders. On our way back, we came across another hiker, a young woman. We talked as we were all sort of taking a rest. And she said she was going to summit one of the peaks later on the trail. The thing is, the trailhead to the peak was about eight hours one way, and she had a light day pack. The next day back at base camp, helicopters swarmed and men were dropping. It was like a movie. I was taken aback. Little did we know it was a huge search and rescue team looking for the same woman I had interacted with not 16 hours before. For three days every night, all I could hear was the distant calls of the men calling her name, all echoing off the base and walls in an endless call for this person. I remember hearing it was a supposed way to end her own life, that she was a seasoned hiker, yet she didn't pack anywhere near enough for this excursion. It didn't make sense. Perhaps she just wanted to get far enough, then stay. That would be her final moment atop a peak, doing something she absolutely loved. I remember after I flew home, I would not stop thinking about her. And I have never stopped. I still search her name, just to find she's never been found. That she is not just without her family, but that she has seemingly disappeared into nothing. It bothers me, thinking of what those hours right after we spoke were like for her. What? she saw last, what her last thoughts were, what she did last. But it doesn't seem to matter. Because whatever any of those answers are, they will quite possibly never be found. Just like she never was. I cannot put into words how much this haunts me to this day. I staffed a summer camp for five years now. A long standing tradition is that some of the senior staffers regularly sneak out during the night and drive into town to hang out and generally be hooligans. Me and four other guys pushed a car around the bend from the parking lot to avoid waking up the adults, 
then hopped inside and headed down towards the town. After a few hours of jokes, Baha blasts from Taco Bell and teaching one of our goons how to drive in an empty parking lot. We're driving down the country roads, joking around and listening to music. That is until we turn down a random road and something immediately feels off. It's about 3.30 AM and we start down a hill and suddenly the road goes from asphalt to gravel to dirt. We then notice a rusted boat trailer on its side, a bunch of old tools, rotting piles of wood and a general mess. That's when we reach the bottom of the hill. There's a big shed with a garage door that's wide open and another shed seemingly made out of plywood with a door creaked open. There's a light shining through the crack of the door faintly, flickering and a fuse box right outside the door. The mood of the car changed in an instant. For a moment, we all sat in silence watching the lights flicker. No one said anything, but we could all tell something didn't feel right. Eventually to ease the tension that we're all feeling, we start to joke as teenage boys do, jeering at one of our friends to turn off the light or open the door, when suddenly the door creaks open. The next few moments are a blur, but I can assure you that was the fastest an early 2000s Toyota Camry has ever booked it up a dirt road. All five of us stayed just about silent during the 15 minute drive back to camp. Something about the aura of the place felt off. To this day, when I imagine sitting in the front seat of that car, I get an uneasy feeling in my stomach. Was someone behind the door? Why were they there at 3.30 in the morning? We were a group of four, my girlfriend, two friends and me. We had a fun evening at home while drinking and playing video games. Because we all had the next day off, we didn't really care about time. And at 1am, my friend told me that they were taking the train home. Me and my girlfriend went with them to the train station. And then we saw that they had missed the last train. So we decided to walk with them home, which is a roughly six kilometer journey. This is all through a forest. We had a good time though, listening to music and singing along, when suddenly I hear something that sounded like a scream. Did you hear that? My girlfriend said that it was a deer. So we carried on. But two minutes later, we heard the scream again. We heard the scream that second time, followed by the word help from a woman. It was so loud and frightening. We immediately sobered up. The woman screamed for help nonstop, and we couldn't see anything in this pitch dark forest. We were trying to locate the screams, but it was quite hard due to the echo. I said, hello, we're coming, don't worry. We thought perhaps a woman had tripped or gotten lost. We called the police in the meantime, and they arrived pretty fast, but there were no screams when they got there. We tried to explain our story to the police, and she screamed again. And then two officers ran into the dark. They found her, but we never got the chance to know what happened there. We heard from other sources that a woman was taken by three men. And I bet you can use your imagination to guess what they did to her. The police told us to leave and that they had to take the woman with them. And they thanked us and called us a taxi. That really freaked us out for a long time. I am an avid hunter. I go every season and I love it. More often than not, I don't kill any game, but I just love getting out into the woods. I don't know if you're familiar with hunting seasons in Pennsylvania, but during late November, rifle season is in full swing. It was already the second week of the season and I had yet to bag any deer. So I was eager to get to it early in the morning. And I did. I normally get up around 5am and drive to my hunting spot. It's private land that my grandfather owns. Him and I are the only two who hunt on it. And the rest is posted to hunters. And the only others on the land are employed on my grandfather's farm. I had originally planned on calling my grandfather when I woke up and asking him if he wanted to tag along. 
but the weather that morning was horrendous. Snow was pouring down, and the wind was really strong. I love hunting in the snow, but it almost made me decide not to go, so I knew he wouldn't want to. The roads were really bad, so it took me a bit longer to drive there. Normally, the sun would be starting to rise by now, however it was overcast and snowing. Regardless of the snow, I walked up to my spot. It was directly behind my grandfather's house, over a hill about 100 to 150 yards away. Almost immediately upon sitting on my spot, I hear things moving all around me. Honestly, I didn't pay it much mind. It could be any number of things, but it was still pitch blank, and the thought that it was a deer had crossed my mind. But there wasn't much I could do. It's not like I can shoot at it. So I just ignore it and continue to wait. It wasn't much longer after that, that I began hearing something walking just over the ridge to my right. At this point, there's barely enough light to see my feet. So even if it was a deer, there was still nothing I could do. However, I could tell it wasn't a deer. I just assumed it was my grandfather walking to his spot, which is just a short walk from mine. But the lights in his house were off. And if he was hunting up here, I'm sure he'd have let me know beforehand. But even if it wasn't him, it was a hunter, albeit hunting illegally. I still wanted to let him know I was here. So I turned on my flashlight and pointed it in his direction, flashing it several times. Again, even if it were a deer, I couldn't shoot it. So I felt it was better to be safe rather than sorry. Nothing much happened after that. After I flashed my light, the noise stopped, which was really odd. I didn't hear them turn back. So I figured that they either, one, sat down right there after seeing my light, which is considered extremely rude, or B, I didn't hear them walk off. I just assumed it was the latter. An hour or so passes, and finally the first signs of daylight start to shine through. It's still snowing and the snow is falling in entire snowballs, rather than snowflakes. So visibility is pretty limited. But I just grinned and bared it. I love snow. And even if I couldn't see any deer, I still found the weather beautiful. It was around this time I noticed an odd looking lump protruding out of the group of trees that was on the top of the hill that separated me from my grandfather's house. Right where I had heard movement earlier, it looked like a mound of dirt. However, it was sticking out the side of a tree. So obviously it wasn't dirt. Naturally, I raised my rifle up to take a closer look. And I could immediately tell that I was looking at the side of an old style camouflage coat. It took a minute, but it finally clicked. That was a person over there. I just thought it was a hunter. So I didn't know what to do about it. I knew he was hunting on our land illegally, and from what I could see, he wasn't wearing anything orange, which is required by all hunters during rifle season. And I could just tell from looking, whoever this was, it wasn't my grandfather. I sat there for a minute debating my next move, but I decided to call him at the risk of blowing his hunt if that was him over there. So without taking my eyes off the guy, I pulled out my phone and dialed his number. To my dismay, he picked up and told him what was going on. So he told me he'd make his way up. But I decided on my own to give this guy a whistle to let him know I'd seen him. But he didn't react at all. After a few minutes, I started to walk up to this guy. And after walking a short distance, I could clearly see him. He was sound asleep tucked in between a shrub and a couple of trees. He obviously thought out where to lay, as I would have never been able to see him if his coat hadn't have stuck out. And as I thought, he had no orange on him. I gave him another whistle and he woke up much louder this time, almost immediately shuffling over to hide his exposed coat. He had a nasty scruffy beard and a gray hat. And honestly, he looked like a harmless old homeless man. 
probably in his mid-fifties, but he had a perfect view of my granddad's home from his spot, and I have a pretty good idea what he was planning to do once my granddad left the house. Once this guy realised he'd been caught, and saw a mad six foot five guy carrying a hunting rifle less than ten yards away, making his way closer, his face went pale. Almost instantly, he tried to feed me some bullshit lie that he'd gotten lost during a drive with another group of hunters. A drive is a coordinated push through a thicket in order to drive deer to hunters sitting at the end of a designated driving area. However, the closest public game land is miles from this spot, so I knew it was a lie. He just kept on going on about how he was lost and how he fell asleep. He even went as far as to make up a fake name on the spot. I just stood there and listened, making sure he didn't make any fishy movements. I couldn't help but think about what this guy could have done to my grandfather. God knows he had the chance. And that thought pissed me off enough to tell the guy to shut up. And that's about the point where I saw my granddad. My granddad is a tough old geezer. So my first thought was, this idiot is going to get himself killed. Luckily, nothing happened. After he got there, we practically had to drag this guy down the road, where my granddad called the cops, and I called my dad. Technically, this guy hadn't done anything wrong yet, so all we could do was charge him with trespassing and stalking. That was about a month ago. And since then, I haven't heard anything else about him. And I don't want to. There are remote cypress swamps along the Pearl River in central Mississippi, and some of them become inaccessible due to flooding during hunting season. The remoteness of some of these places create ideal situations for a hunter willing to put in the extra effort, and I have hunted these woods and swamps for years, and know them well, even though it's a bad idea. When I was younger, I was confident enough to hunt back in there alone. One afternoon during duck season, a front was coming in, and I knew if I could get to Deal Island, that would be a good day. I put on my chest waders and rode my four wheels down an overgrown logging trail in the swamp to the edge of the flood. I waded a couple of sloughs and got to a particular honey hole where I could slay them. I did, and it was good. But, when it came to wade back, I got a sense of unease that I cannot explain. The weather was odd, because even though the temperature was dropping and a front was expected, everything was absolutely still and quiet. If you've ever been alone in a swamp at night, you'll know what I mean. But everything is different, when the only things that you can see is what comes out from the cone of your flashlight. I wasn't worried because my light was good, and hell, I was carrying a 12 gauge shotgun. But still, something kept making the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I was being watched, and I could feel it. Sound carries funny in the swamp, but the sloshing noises I was making were the only things I could hear. It was echoing back to me in funny ways, and when I stopped to adjust the strap on the bag of decoys, the sloshing echoes did not stop when it should have. Okay, there's something else in the swamp. No big deal. Some deer or hog would realise I'm a human in a minute and move away. Except it didn't. I would move for a bit and then stop and listen. The sound of something else out there would stop, but it was getting closer. Not normal. The cone of my flashlight made the trees and tangled brush cast long, scraggly shadows that moved with me. I tried to hurry out of the swamp. My knuckles were turning white on that Remington 870, and I was wishing I was loaded with something heftier than a number two steel shot. I noticed a very bad smell, like skunk, except much worse, and stopped again to listen and shine my light around. I noticed how the shadows continued to move, but holy crap. I'm not moving. Why are the goddamn shadows moving? A limb snapped, and when I spun around to face it, something that was not there made a soft hissing noise. The beam of my light just ended, 
in a shape of nothingness that was not there. A breath of stench hit my face, and I heard that hissing sound again, and I got the hell out of that swamp. I was shaking and drenched in sweat when I got back to the truck, and those woods did not feel like my woods anymore. When I say it was something that was not there, that's the only way I can describe it. My light hit it, and there was shadow behind it, but there was nothing there. Something in the swamp scared the crap out of me, and I do not want to know what it was. This happened to my father-in-law about ten years ago, at our hunting camp, in Alabama. It popped into my head as we are heading there tomorrow for a few days of deer hunting. He told me to go ahead and share his story. It's short, but as I get a little creeped out in the woods, this would have freaked me out. So as some people probably know, we get an hour or so before light and climb into a tree stand or ladder leading up to a seat in a tree usually fairly deep into the woods to hunt. This foggy morning, my father-in-law has been in his stand for a couple of hours. It was getting light, and he was reading a book while he waited for something to happen. Out of the fog, he hears a woman's voice, much closer than anyone should have been to him at the time. She is calling out, Hunter, oh Hunter. Very sing-songy, like a mother calling her child for dinner, as he played outside. Now, as I said, he's pretty deep in the woods, and there are sticks and dried leaves everywhere. You generally make a pretty good racket going into your stand, which is why we have to get out so early. Not only that, but in order to know where he was and spot him camouflaged in a tree, she must have seen his light when he walked out followed him into the woods, and waited hours before calling to him. He first thought the woman was calling someone called Hunter, perhaps her son. She called again and he realised that he is Hunter. So he turns around, peers around the trees and sees a young woman. She, in very few words and halting speech, explains that something is wrong with her hot water heater and asks if he can come and take a look. Now, the strangeness of the situation hadn't set in yet, and he's a give-a-shirt-off-his-back kind of guy. Not to mention, six foot two and nearly 300 pounds with a gun. So he wasn't too worried about this small woman, and starts getting down the tree to have a look. He follows her back to her mobile home, which borders our hunting lands, and are probably about a 10 minute walk away. And she walks inside and leaves the door open. He's trailing behind a little, and he gets to the door, kind of knocks, and sticks his head in to say hello. No answer. Where he entered is a laundry room, and he can see there in the room is a hot water heater, and water is just pouring out of a valve at the bottom, just absolutely pouring onto the floor. He walks over, turns the valve off, sticks his head into the house, and says hello again, and nothing. No answer. The house seems empty. Empty of people, anyway, but it's a disaster inside. At this point, he's starting to see how strange it all is, and decides that this is just a sort of situation that gets you robbed and murdered, and nopes the hell out of there and hurried back to our cabin. Now we have hunted this land for years since, and I've never seen anyone at this place. Although, until this season, it has shown obvious signs of being lived in. So every year I pass by her place, and I always think to myself that I definitely don't want to meet the lady in the trailer with messed up plumbing who may or may not have had nefarious intentions for my father-in-law. My dad wanted to take me hunting for the first time ever. He's always been very big on hunting, and his father before him. So he wanted to take his only son out to make it a father-son kind of thing. I, however, had no interest in hunting, and was far more interested 
in spending my time inside on my violin or on video games, which this was neither of. But I relented and went out with him anyway. He taught me how to use a gun and told me all the tricks of the trade, that we'd be hiding and we had to get out ridiculously early to make our spot and that we'd wait in silence for movement. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Anyway, we get there ridiculously early. It must have been at least 5am, at latest, when we had to make our spot. We sat there in silence, with him occasionally whispering to me that the deers will come out at first light, and that would be our best chance. So there we are waiting, in silence, father and son. I'm not really sure what happened, but it was dark, and it stayed dark. It never got light. About an hour passes and I was bored reading my book. So I turn to my dad and ask him what the time is. He looks at his digital watch, one of those Casio watches from back in the day. And all of the segments were black. I don't really know if that's how you best describe it. But instead of showing the numbers, every part of the watch that had a part to show was black. So it almost looked like it was 88888. So it almost looked like the time was 8888, because everything was filled in, if you understand what I mean. Anyway, he shakes it, presses some buttons, but it doesn't do anything. We say that it's a bit weird and that it should be a little bit sunny by now, and that first light should have broken through. But we sit and wait. I estimate that another half hour to an hour passes, and I'm getting really bored. I know the time we left because I remember setting my alarm, and it should be about 7.30 now, so definitely bright. There's no way it's still dark. I tell my dad I'm getting out, and that I don't care if I make noise because it's this so creepy. He doesn't argue and gets out with me. We start walking back to the car. When we get there, he turns it on to check the time on the internal clock, and it says it's 9.30pm. We just about lose our minds. We're not really sure what's going on, but we quickly go back, pack up our stuff and leave. When we get home, my mother comments that it was strange she didn't hear from us, as we usually text her, or at least my father does when something eventful happens, and asks if we didn't manage to bag anything. We just kind of nod and try and pretend this didn't happen. About a week later, we try and talk about it. Neither of us know what went on that night or day. I don't even know what it was anymore, but we were really messed up. How did we lose a day? Where did an entire day go? I'm lost for words and would love an explanation. I live in Michigan and regularly go out trapping or coyote hunting. One day, I'm taking a long time friend hunting for the first time. He lived out of state, so he wasn't familiar with the area and its types of people and habits so to speak. It was wintertime in Michigan, and at the time we were actually having one of our coldest winters on record. We were walking along, and unfortunately, the coyote spot I usually used had now become useless after so many uses of traps and shots taken there. So we went a bit deeper to look for a better spot. The coyotes had a den in some lowlands and thick brush. I don't usually go out there, but I didn't want my friend's first hunt to be boring, so we pressed on. After a bit of walking, my friend noticed a blood trail, and I assumed another hunter hit and wounded one. I figured we would track to make sure it didn't suffer, so we followed the blood trail. The strange part was we didn't notice any tracks, and it was winter, so tracks would be easy to spot. However, when we reached the source, we ended up finding something a lot more gruesome. 
we came across the dead bodies of a man and a woman. The man had a crossbow bolt in his stomach and looked like he had been stabbed. The woman was stabbed much worse and looked like she had been sexually assaulted. Needless to say, we called the police. Additionally, it seems the suspect was caught, although not by law enforcement. It turns out the girl he murdered was his ex-wife, who ended up divorcing him, and the guy was her new boyfriend. The guy who killed them actually ended up running back into the lowland swamp area, where he had kind of a lean setup, where he was found dead from frostbite and drinking far too much and passing out in the cold. Drugs also seem to have been involved. The crossbow bolt that the couple were shot with actually had high amounts of some kind of venom, or would it be poison, on the tip, although it seemed to be a paralyzing one. Also due to the heavy amount of snowfall, the blood trail was extremely visible even in low light. But according to the police report, it seems like the conclusion was the guy was hit by the bolt, became unable to move, and the woman ended up attempting to drag him to safety with him, trailing behind her, thus running over her tracks for the most part, which might explain why we were unable to see what would otherwise be easily identifiable footprints. Although because he was a fairly larger guy, she wasn't able to drag him for long, until her ex caught up. I've never been back to those woods since, and now when I go out, I always wear body armour underneath my vest, and make sure I'm not alone. I have a hunting spot that I frequent. Not crazy far off the grid or anything like that. Terrain is a pain in the ass but it's a pretty hidden spot that is close to my house. Anyway, I hunt a lot of small game there and see a ton of mule deer any time I go out. One morning I get there about 5.30 and have some time to kill before I start my hike in. I have an odd feeling in the parking lot, but just chalk it up to too much coffee on an empty stomach. That's giving me anxiety. So I decide to start hiking in and about 300 yards into my hike, I notice this pile of downed trees slash branches slash general debris that I hadn't seen before. It was my first time hunting in this particular place on this particular season, so I figured some folks came out and did some fire migration work. I didn't pay too much attention to it until I noticed there's an odd amount of movement coming from it. Pretty small movement, but it sticks out when a brush pile is wiggling on a still day. It was also about 5.45am, and the wilderness just sort of has this stillness to it, and at this point any movement is noticeable. So I stop, and start examining the pile to figure out what's going on. I figure there's a rabbit in there, maybe some squirrels, and I figure I've hit the jackpot, and I'm definitely going to bag something. I start deciding the best way to flush whatever it is out, and still have my shotgun up in time to take a good shot. I realise I'm standing by a decent sized branch, and my best move is to stomp on the branch. If all goes according to plan, everything will freeze, then whatever is in there will dart out. I try to figure out where the rabbit will come out of, get ready, and BAM! I stomp on the branch and snap it in half. The pile goes still, and that stillness is quiet. Then a mountain lion, with a bloody nose and mouth, pops out of the pile. At this point, I'm about 10 yards away from it. I have a shotgun, but really don't want to shoot the lion. I also don't want to fire a shot off in the air to scare it, because all of this was a pretty cool experience that very few people get to have. I froze, and it was looking at me very quizzically. Then, in one quick motion, it hopped out of the brush pile, ran uphill, and got about 40 yards away from me, and disappeared into the trees. I've never seen something cover 40 yards uphill 
in such a fast and graceful way. One of the coolest things I've ever gotten to experience. I went to check out the brush pile when it left, and sure enough, it was feasting on a mule deer. Still my favourite story from whenever I was out in the woods. I was turkey hunting. Full gobbler, I think, if I recall correctly. Anyway, I was walking to my spot in my orange, and had just started to tuck it away. For non-hunters, turkey can see colour, so the regulation states that hunters need to wear 250 square inches of orange while moving, but you can take it off and just wear regular camo when you get to your spot. In my management zone, you just need to put some orange somewhere within 15 feet of you to let other hunters know you're in the area, and to be vigilant. I finish up stowing my orange away, and sit down and start using my call. I eventually hear something coming from away, and it's calling back. As the sound gets closer, I start to think that maybe it's too big to be a turkey. Maybe it's a small flock. I go to call again and a shot goes off far too close for me, and I shit bricks. I had not seen anyone come in, nor had I seen any orange hanging in a tree to signify someone else was hunting there, so I thought I was pretty isolated. Another shot goes off, closer, and the chucking call starts back up. Now I'm certain of two things. One, there is no turkey, as they would have scattered because of the shots, and two, I have an idiot out here trying to stalk me thinking I'm a turkey, and he's following my calls and shooting blind, or seeing me move and assuming I'm a bird. Either way, I'm shitting bricks, and I decide to yell out, Oh, but I'm not a bird. Quit shooting. And another shot goes off. I'm terrified to so much as wiggle a finger at this point, because I can't see this guy, but I know he's shooting in my direction and trigger happy. I'm sitting there hollering that I'm a human and contemplating the idea of moving to grab my orange and wave it to signify to this guy that he's shooting at a person. When a third shot goes off and I actually hear the BBs hitting shit near me. I hit the deck and laid flat for two hours, absolutely crapping myself until I was sure they were gone. For any non-hunters out there, this is a known issue within turkey hunting, because you need to remove your visibility orange. And because you're calling as an attractant, some assholes will attempt to stalk what they think is a turkey, and end up stalking another hunter. And in their idiot fervour, they shoot at the first thing that moves. Say another hunter itching their nose, a good number of people had died that way and it made me swear off turkey hunting. In September of this year, I was hunting antelope out near the Red Desert in Wyoming. I had just shot my antelope, and was walking about 150 yards out to where he had dropped, so I could tag and begin field dressing the animal. I should mention I'm about 40 miles away from the main road, and have not seen another human or vehicle since I got off the main road. This area is extremely remote. It's even hard to describe. So as I'm walking out to the antelope, I look up, and about one to two miles off in the distance, I see this extremely bright light zooming over the landscape and heading my way. I thought it was probably a game warden on a side-by-side -side coming to check my paperwork and all. No big deal. I keep walking out and find the animal, and look up and see this light dives down into this sage bush, and I can no longer see it. It was about a half mile from me when it disappeared. I also noticed I didn't hear any engines, if in fact it was someone on a motorised vehicle. I'm mostly confused at this point, not sure what the hell this light is, or where it went, but I continue on tagging the antelope. It takes me all of 10 to 15 seconds to put the tag on, when I look up and see the light travelling away from me, and is about 3 to 5 miles away from me, going at least 100 miles an hour. 
It was really zooming away faster than any vehicle could travel over that type of terrain. Also, there are no roads or anything where the light is traveling, so I don't know how it got so fast, and I'm pretty spooked at this point. I field dressed the animal as fast as I could and dragged it back to my truck. I had a very uneasy feeling at this point. I have no idea what that light was, although some others have speculated it was a drone. But if it were a drone operated by the game warden, why didn't he just come out once I got to my truck? This happened to my grandfather about 50 years ago. He was an avid hunter. But after this incident, his love of hunting pretty much stopped. He always tells this story with a chill in his eye. He explains that many years ago, he was out hunting in the forest for white-tailed deer. He had a really good spot and was just waiting on the ground under a tarp for something to happen. Whilst he was waiting, did he notice something unusual in the background? There was talking. And before he knew it, five men all dressed in suits and shades, started walking through the forest. They were all silent. They didn't look anywhere except straight ahead. They walked, and he was unsure what people were doing in such a remote area. He didn't say anything at first. But feeling very creeped out, thinking that maybe they were government officials and that there was something very wrong in this area, he got out from his hiding place and started approaching them. That's when they all stopped and turned and looked at him in unison. As he approached them and was giving them a greeting, did they all vanish into thin air? Bear in mind that this was in the early hours of the morning and there was plenty of sunlight. He wasn't on any drugs or alcohol or medication and saw them as clear as day just vanish in front of him. He hightailed it back, drove home, never hunted again. I don't blame him. I get freaked out just thinking about it. I was hunting a big field for whitetail. It was public land, and I decided not to set up a tree stand and just sit behind some heavy cover on the ground. I tried to get to my spots well before sun's up, so I'm not making any noise at first light, when many deer start to move. I got to my spot about 5am. It was absolutely pitch black, and all I had was my headlamp. After I switched off my headlamp, it was quiet for about 30 seconds, when suddenly, I heard a howl from my right side. It was clear the howl came from the edge of the field I was in, roughly 200 yards away. It sent shivers down my spine. About 30 seconds passed, and I heard a second howl in the opposite direction, on the other end of the field, probably 200 yards the other way. At this point, I'm pretty freaked out, but I figure it's highly unlikely anything would attack me. Not much longer, and from directly behind me, somewhere in the thick of the woods, a third howl. I now feel surrounded and I'm terrified. My truck was around 500 yards away to the left, along the edge of the woods in the field and down a narrow path that cuts right through the woods. I flicked on my headlamp, took the safety off my gun, equipped my hunting knife, and got the hell out of there as fast as I could. I waited until the sun came up before I went back and actually hunted. I never saw a deer that entire weekend. I presume whatever was howling drove the deer out, and I don't blame the deer one bit. The entire experience was very scary, and I've done a lot of hunting and camping, and spent a ton of time in the woods, both during the day and night, and nothing has ever freaked me out that badly. This happened after my hunt for some whitetail in northern Michigan. I was leaving the woods and heading to my car, preparing myself for the long ride home. The sun was setting and the air was crisp, and the smell of fall was in the air. 
as I got to my car, I heard some rustling in the brush on the other side of the trail I was parked on. Thinking it was an animal, I looked across and saw a guy standing there. He was slightly swaying from side to side. Not a drunk sway, but more of an impatient standing in line for a long time type of sway. Hey man, are you lost? I said. He didn't answer, but he gave the creepiest smirk and tilted his head back slightly without taking his eyes off me. Needless to say, I was creeped the hell out. My gun made me feel protected, but as I loaded my pack and my shotgun into the car, I didn't take my eyes off him, and he kept his locked on mine. I kept my 9mm on me in case he tried something, and I was parked parallel to the trail. So when I got in the car, I could still see him. I drove and checked my mirror, and he was in the middle of the trail just walking in my direction. That was the creepiest day hunting I have ever had. When I was younger, my dad told me this story from a hunting trip he went on in the Appalachian Mountains. He spent the majority of the day without seeing a thing, and was ready to pack up and leave when a white-tailed deer showed up. He shot it, but it ran away, and he had to go and track it down. About a half hour later, he came across the downed animal, after following a very distinct blood trail. Shortly after, he began field dressing the deer, a group of four armed men in regular clothing walked through the forest and approached him. He always describes them as mountain men when he tells the story. Anyway, one of the men told my dad the deer was their kill, and that he should leave. My dad, never one for confrontation, argued that he had just shot it, and that he followed the blood trail all the way to the deer. At this point, the men unslung their rifles and pointed them at my dad telling him these are their mountains and that they'll be taking the deer. They made claims that people have hunting accidents all the time and how unfortunate it would be for him to have one. He left and called the police, which resulted in the responding officer telling my dad that there was nothing they could do about it because they don't want to have a fight on their hands with the locals. East Tennessee, ladies and gentlemen. I can't explain this, but we were hunting 25 years ago, and we found a white-tailed deer frozen into a river by his feet. This is where it gets weird. This animal was cut in half. His rear end was missing, but it was how clean the cut was. It had looked like it was done with a bandsaw. Also, the animal had been gutted like it was cleaned out with an ice cream scoop completely cleaned. No blood trail, no guts, just half a frozen deer in the ice, eyes wide open, missing its entire backside. I've got no explanation for this, and I really don't think I even want to think about it anymore, as I still can't even fathom what happened. When I was 15, I was hunting in the Colorado Rockies for elk. We were around 12 to 15 miles up a mountain with no cell reception or anything. I'd been there twice before this incident took place and I was out with my uncle when we heard a woman scream. Curious and a little frightened, we decided to go check it out. We were hiking over a ridge for around 10 minutes when we saw bloody clothing and a t-shirt and shorts and nothing else. No footprints or anything to indicate where the scream had gone. We hightailed it back to camp and began to pack up, it being our last two days. We packed out the next day and went to the ranger's service and gave them the location of the scene. And that was it. They asked a few questions and said they'd follow up, but we never heard anything. I used to be a field appraiser. I was at a parcel and was doing data collection. 
for some 20-foot shipping containers that had appeared in the last several months. It was obvious they were being used as hunting cabins during hunting season. As I was finishing up, I turned around to walk back to my vehicle, and standing right there were two hunters. They were dressed head to toe like snipers, with ghillie suits on, and large caliber rifles pointing right at me. That, as you can imagine, scared the heck out of me. Of course, they were mouthy and pissed off towards me. Then, when they found out what I was doing, that escalated things even more. I don't blame them, really. They saw me walking around, looking and measuring everything, and taking photos of the place.